Hi everyone, I'm Erica Rackley and uh, next to me is Kirsty Horsey and we're going to be leading today's webinar. It's great for, to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you enjoy um, today's session, which is the first um, webinar in the second of the annual KLS um, Summer of Law webinar series. So if you want to check out what's gone before, last year's sessions are all on YouTube. You can go and um, check them out. In particular, if you're interested in this topic, you might be interested in one on um, what the different courts do, which was led by our colleagues Hannah Phillips and Marie Kerrin. Um, but of course, they're all great. So go and um, do take a look. Oh, welcome, everybody. So today's session, we're going to be asking one key question, uh, which is who are our judges and why does it matter? Uh, and you might think that the, the answer to that is obvious or not relevant. After all, it's not judges who make our law, Parliament makes law, and judges are there to just neutrally and objectively apply the law to the cases that come before them. So it doesn't, in theory, or at least it shouldn't matter which judge hears your case, uh, but we're going to suggest uh, that things are a bit more complicated than that. Today we're going to focus uh, mostly on the UK Supreme Court, the highest court, uh, we're going to take a critical look at who gets to decide some of the UK's most important and contentious cases. Uh, and we'll be asking a potentially controversial question. Does a judge's background impact their decision making? And if so, does it matter? So that's what we're going to do. Um, we're hoping that the session can be as interactive as, as possible. So if you, we've got a few questions um, as we're going through the webinar for you to respond to. Um, so do use the chat to um, respond to those questions. Only Kirsty and I um, are able to see that. And so we'll be able to respond to that as we're um, moving along. We are really interested in um, getting a, a sense of what uh, it is you have to say. So we're going to spend a bit of time looking at who our judges are um, and who are, where, our, where our judges um, sit. And then we're going to move on and think about why this is um, important by looking at a real life um, case example. But I realise that we've not introduced ourselves. So um, I'm Erica Rackley. I'm a professor at Kent Law School. Um, I'm also deputy head of the law school and I spend a fair bit of my time thinking and writing about um, judges and the judiciary and particularly about um, feminist judging. But I also teach torts with um, Kirsty and Writer Torts textbook um, with, with Kirsty, which will be the textbook that if you do come to Kent, you'll be using in your um, introduction to obligations and um, tort law modules. Have a look out, there's a new edition coming. We've been working on it over during lockdown. We've been working on the, the new edition complete with, what is it we've got on the front? Is it coconuts? Coconuts, coconuts on the front um, yeah. this time. So Kirsty, Randomly. introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Kirsty Horsey. I'm a reader at Kent Law School. Um, it's a beautiful campus you might be able to see behind me in a, in a picture. Um, I've been at Kent for many, many years now. I started, I came to Kent originally as an undergraduate student, so I have had the experience of being a first year at Kent Law School myself. Uh, I teach mainly tort law with a bit of family law and medical law thrown in, and I'm also director of study of Kent Law School which means that I have overall sort of responsibility for how the teaching program runs within the school. Um, so yeah, that's me. That's you. Oh, uh, oh. Kirsty and I have, have known each other for years and have been teaching and working together on our various um, projects for, for a number of years now. So it's really good that we get to um, talk to you now. Shall I put the slides up so we can start the first question? Yeah. All right. Just sharing my screen, there you go. So, question. Okay, so we're going to uh, start off with the first question for you. Uh, as you see there, what do you think of when you see think? What do you think of when you think of a judge, or what comes into your head when you think about judges? Oh, sorry, I've gone, I've gone over. <laughs> um, sorry, I was fiddling, I was fiddling around. I was trying to find the um, chat function. That was what I was doing there. I have now found it. Uh, so. But yeah, I was going to say, feel free to start typing answers into chat. What's the first thing? One, you know, one, two words, something like that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Some of those answers are, uh, you know, what we were. They're there. So what we got? Oh, Judge Judge Winder. That's a that's a cool one. So we got Judge TV Winder, personalities yeah. coming in. 
somebody give, who gives a verdict to a case. Wow, I feel like what? Uh, oh, I, anyway, uh, it's decision maker. Work here is done. <laughs> I like I like this. Oxbridge educated. That's a that's a good one. Now we need to scroll down. Final yeah, say. Independent, unbiased, justice. That is cool. Oh, somebody saying a man. They're there. Someone said wigs. Oh, did somebody say wigs? Has yeah. anyone said gavel yet? Or have I put no said that? gavel? <laughs> by putting the picture up too early. Dispense it. Interpreter of law. That's a good and interesting one. Interpret influential. I wonder what that I wonder what the, that person means by, by influential. What, what what do you mean by that? Do you mean influential in terms of on the law, or do you mean in society generally when you're talking about a judge being um influential? Um regulator here. Some I like this one. I missed goes up. Did you say this already, Kirsty? Someone who's experienced. Experience obviously um, sometimes no, goes scro with scrolling through. There's lots of good answers. They're they're, they're very very clever. Is is coming in. So I think what we're, we're drawing out from these comments and what I'd like you to be thinking about when you're thinking of these judges is that there are some themes emerging here. So one of the themes is on the judges' personal or identity characteristics, like who they are, whether they are a man or a woman, where they went to university, how old they are, their ethnicity and so on. So the, what we might think of as the personality of the judge. So one of the things we think of when we think of a judge is a kind of visual image of the human, of the human being. And then the other theme that's coming out here is around their expertise, like what they do. So they dispense justice, they send people to um, prison, they determine um, the rulings of uh, a particular case, they decide how a case is going to be decided, they interpret um, the law. And then the, the reason I was a uh, second theme, and then I've, I preempted, because the other thing that comes up sometimes when we think of a judge is the sort of the symbols of, of a judge. And that's where the sort of idea of a, of a week might, might come for. And I was thinking now about, about the gavels, because you know, like one of the things if you are to become a law student is one of the things law students like to have is to kind of make out that they know a lot of stuff and it's particularly kind of interesting trivia. So I thought that one of the things that I might do when we're chatting together is tell you some quite interesting facts. And the first quite interesting fact is about gavels. Now, normally what you get is people getting very cross when um, there are images of gavels being shown next to pictures of the English legal system, because unlike our US counterparts, our judges in, in the English and Wales uh, system don't use gavels. We don't use gavels. And so there's been various kind of Twitter campaigns and things to, to, to stop these images of the gavel. It's a misrepresentation of what's going on. And however, there is a slight ha ha, but did you know, um, coming out in relation to the gavel, which is that um, clerks, so the, the kind of people who administer the court in the um, inner London Crown Courts do use gavels. They use gavels to bang on the door as opposed to using their hands. So it's not quite true to say that there's no connection between gavels and the English legal system. The judges don't use them on the bench, but they are used in our courtroom. Anyway, first of the quite interesting facts. So the themes that I'm wanting us to pick up on are the judge and the personality of the judge, who that judge, who that judge is, the judges as people. And then the other thing I'm wanting to talk about is like what they do. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry about that. I've just knocked over my children's marble run. So if you heard that crash, that's what it is. I'm very sorry. Um, so the other is what they um, do. And so like kind of the, uh, the decisions they make and how they make their decisions. So um, over to you, Kirsty, for the next question. Okay, so we'll stay with personal or identity characteristics uh, for a moment. Next question, uh, we're now showing you some images uh, and we're gonna play a game that we like to call Spot the Judge. Uh, so this is a slide with various images of possible judges and we'd like you to put, you know, use the letters to put in chat uh, which ones of those are or were judges. Okay, so we've got a C and There might be more than one. There might be more than one. Um... I'm liking this. You get. I think we could do like bonus points if anyone is able to name any of these judges. Oh yeah, that would be extra bonus points for for doing that. So what have we got? Oh look, somebody... see. Oh look, we've got a name, Lady Hale. She's come in. 
Lots of people saying E. E, lots yeah, of C let's as well. Pale. B's, B's. Did you say C's coming in as well? C came in a few. All right. Has, uh, someone has someone said maybe or has someone said anyone, probably not G because they look too young. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So will be very happy about that. <laughs> people coming, coming in. Has anyone said D yet? Or all except for A and D? Yeah. Kirsty, who are the judges? The answer is, and a couple of people have got this right, all of them are. Uh, so just go through them very quickly. A is Lord Phillips, the former president of the UK Supreme Court. Um, obviously he's a bit dressed down Friday there, so he doesn't he doesn't look much like a judge in that particular picture. Uh, B yes, is Lord Justice Singh. Sorry, Erica. Yes, I was going to interrupt there to tell you another quite interesting fact about Lord Ooh, Phillips in the picture. So Lord Phillips, so when the um so uh, when the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords, which is what existed before our Supreme Court. When they moved over and became the Supreme Court, there was a move towards making the judges more visible. And one of the things that they did was that they put their pictures on the website. And so they obviously went round to the justices and said, can we have a picture of what you look like or have a picture of you so we can put them on the um, on the website? And I couldn't find it. So I had to go with this picture of Lord Phillips. But the picture that Lord Phillips chose when he was asked to do that was a picture of him and what I assume was his grandson wearing matching Hawaiian shirts. So Lord Phillips has like form in terms of like having these images out there, which might not be the traditional uh, judicial images, as opposed to B. Sorry, that's where you got to. B yeah. is, uh, yeah, Lord Justice Singh. Uh, so much more traditional uh, judges robes type thing going on there. C is Judge Anuja Deer QC, uh, who's a judge at the Old Bailey in 2017. She's the circuit court judge in 2012 and a recorder. Uh, not the musical instrument, but the uh, type of judge in 2010. Um, D, we did have a couple of people say not D. D is our very own Professor Helen Carr, who, uh, if you come to us, may you end up teaching you land law and related subjects like that. But she's also a part time judge with the first tier tribunal uh, for property uh, and has been for more than 10 years and her workload includes like, rent cases, do you know, dodgy landlords, service charges, housing app cases. Uh, and that kind of thing. E, as some of you rightly uh, identified, is Lady Hale, uh, the former president of the Supreme Court. F is the current master of the roles, Sir Geoffrey Voss. Uh, G is uh, Lady Justice Simlar, uh, sitting in the Court of Appeal, obviously not there. Uh, and H is the current Lord Chief Justice, Lord Burnett, and I is Jonathan Sumption, who was also a former Supreme Court Justice, also now retired. Co fairly um, outspoken and controversial, as you'll come to discover. So, and we, I picked these judges because these are judges who um, you may, you may or may not come across as you're um, studying. You will, you know, you will be reading a number of judgments. I'm really glad that a number of you recognised um, Lady Hell. She was wearing her um, famous spider brooch in that particular picture, and of course, it was Lady Hell who was president of the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court heard the um, Miller case um, around the Brexit. Um, litigation. And so oh, I wanted to kind of begin to unpack is that we might go from what might be considered like a stereotypical image of the judge was usually would be relatively old, um, white and male, and kind of question and sort of say, well, what happens when we look to see who our judges are is that there is more vari more variation than that. And we can find examples of um, judges who don't look and who aren't like the stereotypical judge and yet that seems to be a bit too easy to do and so there continues to be a fair bit of discussion about the diver about diversity in the judiciary it came up again towards the end of last year when um it was announced that Lady Black was going to retire from the Supreme Court. Lady um, Hale had um, previously retired. And were we going to go back to having just one woman um, on the Supreme Court? We actually, we didn't, we've, we've got two, but 
two, two out of 12 is, is not particularly um, great and three is the highest that we've ever had. And so judicial diversity is something that comes up as something that we might need to be thinking about. And so although we can find images and we there are examples of judges who don't fit the stereotypical image, in fact, the, the, the judiciary isn't particularly um, diverse. And I'm going to give you a, a quick canter through the um, stats. Now, my, my, my job here is not to give you a detailed statistical analysis of the um, judiciary. If that's your bag, then the um, stats are available from the Ministry of Justice and the Judiciary of England and Wales um, websites. And you can and pull them apart. But what I wanted to do here was to give you a flavor of um, what the judiciary, um, how the judiciary might, might um, and what the judiciary looks like. And so this is a sort of very simple um, diagram so that we can see how, and what we can see from this diagram is see that from the kind of in the lower echelons of the judiciary, that that, that is much more, um, there's much more equality and parity between um, men and women and how this changes as we move up through the um, judicial hierarchy. So if we start at the bottom over with the tribunals, um, we about 47% of tribunal judges are um, women. Now, tribunals are at the bottom of the judicial hierarchy. They're independent um, judicial bodies set up by parliament to resolve disputes between individuals and private organisations and state agencies. So in England and Wales, there's about 100 tribunals. They have um, different remits, whether it's to do with um, agricultural land or employment, asylum and immigration, housing, and so on. And it's in one of these that Professor Helen Carr um, sits in, the image that you saw on the previous slide. So we're doing pretty well in the tribunals, although the tribunals sit outside of the formal um, kind of court structure. So the first group of kind of court judges would be the magistrates. Kirsty. So the magistrates court is where all criminal cases at first instance are heard and after which uh, the more serious cases are transferred to the Crown Court and Magistrates also hear some civil cases, including family proceedings, uh, followed by circuit judges and district judges and recorders and the deputy district judge who are part time judges and they sit variously in the Crown County and family courts. Um, in the Crown Courts, there'll usually be circuit judges and recorders hearing serious criminal cases, you know, such as murder or robbery or rape. Sometimes members of the High Court will sit in the Crown Court when they're on circuit. It's all very complicated and we're not, we're not testing you at the end or anything. Uh, cases in these courts are heard by a judge and a jury. Uh, the judge does not decide guilt or innocence. This is the jury's job. It's the jury to decide whether somebody is guilty or innocent. Usually that decision has to be unanimous, but the judge may decide to accept a majority verdict um, if it proves difficult for all 12 jurors to agree on a particular outcome. What the judge does do is advise the jury about the law uh, and how it applies to that particular case. Uh, and the judge is, uh, judge's role also includes sentencing, imposing a sentence if the defendant is found guilty. Circuit judges and recorders also sit in the county courts alongside district judges and deputy district judges. They hear cases involving civil, um, by which we mean non-criminal, uh, and non-family disputes. Uh, so usually disputes between individuals or businesses where someone believes their rights have been infringed in some way. Uh, that's, the, that's the stuff that Erica and I write about uh, in tort law, uh, as one example. Uh, the types of civil case dealt with in the county court include things like businesses trying to recover money they are owed, so things like contract cases also in those in those courts. Also individuals seeking compensation for injuries, and that's that's us, our tort law, um, usually the tort of negligence, and landowners seeking orders that will prevent trespass. In the family court, where most family type cases are heard, uh, you get a much wider group of judges, high court judges, circuit judges, recorders, district judges, deputy district judges and magistrates. Uh, and as you can see at the sort of magistrates and to an extent at the lower courts, we're doing pretty well on the diversity front. In fact, there are more female than male uh, magistrates. But other than that, then we start uh, moving up the courts. Uh, 
Erica. So, um, time for another quite interesting fact. Um, so Kirsty mentioned circuits, those not being the exercise class where you do call outs and um, burpees. Uh, circuits are six geographical um, regions in England and Wales, which are split up for the, um, the practice of law. And those are the areas that the High Court judges will um, travel to. When, if you hear about judges going out on circuit, that's where they um, go to. And the circuit, circuit tradition is deeply embedded in um, the, our understanding of the judiciary. It was established by Henry II in 1166 as a means by which to unite the laws across the um, lands of um, England and Wales. So they went, he would send his judges out onto the circuit so that they were able to kind of unify and to, to sort of make sure that there was some kind of uniformity um, between um, local customs. So there were sort of various local customs there. They was trying to get uniformity and bring about sort of national law. And that's the roots. Those are the roots of our common law. So when we, when you hear about the talking uh, about common law, by which we often mean case law, and we talk about um, it, the England and Wales being a, a common law um, jurisdiction, the, this is the sort of the origins of the common law. Now, it, the, the court hierarchy and the court structure is something that you will, be, will become incredibly familiar with you as you go through your um, studies. There's various ways in which um, we at Kent and uh, uh, we sort of introduce you to an overview of the court system. And then what you'll do is as you begin to study various subjects, you'll find a, a way into understanding the operation of these courts and how they are um, structured. Now, someone in the chat is asking whether the circuits are like jurisdictions. They're not, they're not really like jurisdictions. So jurisdictions would be where there is a sort of a, a, a um, law that applies simply to that area. So it's a law of that particular area. The circuits are just sort of areas. They're more like, um, probably would be better to be understood as like kind of constituencies or, or counties. So, so one judge, yeah, one judge will move from one circuit to another. Um, the high court judges will generally have a particular, so circuits, the circuit judges will sit on a in a circuit like a kind of so like in a, a sort of like a yeah like a constituency area or a local authority area but high court judges will be sent out to circuits and the, the circuits that they go to can um vary and without getting too off the point because we're talking about diversity and just so you know this this is one of the kind of ways in which history and understanding of the legal history kind of bashes into understandings of diversity because of course individuals willingness and ability to do the traveling to go and spend time on circuit to spend time away from their um, usual home in a judicial lodgings or hotel to hear a particular case for a number of weeks will often, often will obviously vary and so there's a sort of sense in which the circuit system is one of the things when you kind of delve into it whether we whether it's something that we still need to to hold on to. Anyway, that's the circuits. Once we get up to the high courts, the kind of diversity and the gender balance kind of slips away and you, you move up through the high court, which is when we start talking about the high court and above. So the high court, the court of appeal and the Supreme Court, often that's referred to as the senior judiciary. When we start talking about the senior judiciary, the number of women fall um, dramatically. These are the cases, these are the courts where the most serious cases are heard. So the high court is where the most complex civil and family law um, uh, cases are heard at first instance. The court of appeal, which is the our appellate court, which is divided into two divisions, the criminal and the civil division. That's where um, uh, appeals are heard. Um, there, women's uh, representation is about 23%. And then we have the Supreme Court, which was established in 2009, which is the final Court of Appeal in the um, United Kingdom. So once we get up, and as you can see, the, the orange um, bar goes down. So the number of, of women making it into the, um, to the, to the higher level, to the higher judiciary is, um, is, is getting lower and, and this is important in, in one way because of what the topics of those courts, um, what they're deciding, the kind of the importance of what they're deciding. So whereas when we look at um, the magistrates courts, for example, there they're likely to be 
dealing with cases where there's a question, the questions of fact, did somebody do this? And what's the consequence of the person, the defendant um, doing it? Once we get up to the civil law, to the Supreme Court, what the courts is deciding are questions of kind of principle and law and are looking to, um, to go to, um, and are looking to, to kind of reach a, a uh, have a decision which then becomes precedent, it becomes part of the common law that I was talking about, um, for which the other courts um, have to follow. So the, the verdict of the Supreme Court, or the kind of the, the importance of the Supreme Court on the kind of general understanding of what judges do, in the second aspect, sort of judges as a decision maker and an interpreter of law, that's what happens in the um, in the Supreme in the Supreme Court. Um, somebody earlier on in the chat asked us about the representation of um, uh, ethnicity in the judiciary, and and I I again this is I think that the, the images speak for themselves. So again, it the the lower tribunals and the magistrates courts are much um, more representative, uh, much more representative, are, rep have, are much more representative than the rest of the um, judiciary, but are still nowhere, um, still not representative really at all. So there's about 10% of um, the people who are very identified. So when they filled in the equality um, diversity forms, have identified us from a BAM, BAME background, it's about 10% in the tribunals and magistrates. Um, dropping down to three, three percent in the High Court and um, six in the the Court of Appeal. Um, BA, sorry, BAME is Black, Asian, and um, Minority Ethnicity. So it's a, an acronym that's commonly used um, when looking uh, at issues relating to ethnicity in um, statistical um, analysis. So what we can see is when we're looking at the various lenses that the, and I've used two today, so I've used the lens of gender and I've used the lens of ethnicity. When we're using these various lenses, these are ways in which we can begin to understand what the judiciary as a whole looks like, and it makes a difference whether we are looking at the judiciary from the tribunals all the way up to the Supreme Court, whether we're simply looking at our highest court, the Supreme Court, whether we're looking at our senior judiciary and so on. And so it's important, and again, this is something that you can think more about um, when you come to your legal studies that's important that when we're talking about diversity and who our judges are I've used gender and ethnicity as examples but of course there are many other um, ways in which we might look at um, look for or look look at um, diversity and one of those um, I want to talk about in relation to our Supreme Court so these are our Supreme Court justices um, they're there. Whenever I look at these photos, it always feels like they're school photos because they all look the same, um, except for Lady Rose at the um, bottom there, who has um, uh, only just joined and so has yet to um, have her photo taken. As you can see, um, these judges are remarkably similar in, in many visible and non-visible um, ways. So. Um, Two, two women out of the, the, the 12 justices, as I say, um, <laughs> glasses, yeah, we all wear glasses. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the most women that we've had on the Supreme Court is three. We have never had um, a Supreme Court justice from a visible, visible minority on the um, Supreme Court. And then if we begin to look into the um, backgrounds of these judges, I was looking them up and somebody mentioned when asked about what you think of when you think of a judge earlier on, somebody talked about Oxbridge. Um, and so everyone went to um, Oxbridge as opposed, as except for Lord Stevens who went to Manchester, he's sitting down the bottom um, next to Lady Rose on the um, the bottom row, um, he went to, to Manchester. And then and Oxbridge, sorry, Oxbridge is um, the a colloquial term that we use to um, define, uh, to describe Oxford, the, the colleges at Oxford and Cambridge University. It's an amalgamation of those um, two words and they're simply something that uh, they're a way in which we are able to identify a particular educational background. And this is one of the things that people talk about within diversity is that it's not simply the visible personality characteristics of the judge, but it's also their experiences, where they've been, the types of um, encounters that they've had. So not particularly diverse, but um, 
now over to you. I'd like to know, do you think this matters? And if you do think it matters, if you do think it matters, you don't have to think it matters. If you do think it matters, why does it matter? All right, so I'm well, well, working, needing you to wake up. So does it matter that our judges all look fairly similar? So I guess what I've been trying to do is try to say, well, we have this stereotype of the judge. The stereotype is not quite right, but it kind of is in, in many ways. And so we've got people coming in saying it, it shouldn't matter, but then saying that if it might matter because they're not able to relate to the issues heard in, in the courts. Any other, any other matters because of representation? Yes, yeah, so about sort of vis visibility. Um, the idea that sort of how their experiences might in, in, inform how they're um, making the decisions. I'm saying about judges relating to others, somebody saying that you might not be getting the best. Is it true? Is, are we really getting the best judges here if, if they all end up looking quite, um, quite similar? Uh, yeah, perceptions of bias. More maybe. on representation there that... Yeah. Yeah, it's a serious because they deal with serious stuff. Absolutely. Someone's, yeah, someone said bias. Someone said if there's favoritism, then it matters. And that a judge's background may influence a lot of their decisions in court. Humans cannot be objectively impartial, naturally biased in conscious or unconscious ways. Mm -hmm. uh, someone says something about public confidence and the needs of minority groups. Perpetuation of class, race, and gender injustice. Uh, and someone says both yes and no, that it doesn't matter. I like to think there's, a, there's another comment here about whether they all have a judicial uniform as, as well. And there's certainly but things written on that um, that you can you can um, can read up on and the way in which uh, the presentation of, of the judge and the, the wig being a key aspect of the judicial uniform in some courts um, and the importance that that plays. Um, Kirsty, do you want to pick up on some of the themes that are coming out of there? Yeah, just look at the last question. It matters that there's no black judges in the senior courts. Also, diversity establishes role models, um, which is a thing you, you know you want to look to see yourself and yeah, have message for aspiring lawyers. You want to you want to be able to see yourself up there, don't you? So that um, you've got something, uh, you know, that representation thing, isn't it? Um, so we're looking at sort of arguments for a more diverse judiciary and some of the ones have been you know made in this chat that, that you know lots of those reasons are exactly some of the reasons why we should argue that, that, that ju the judiciary should be more diverse so these arguments typically fall into three broad categories one is democratic legitimacy as you see on the slide there another one is about equal opportunities uh, and another one is about difference so the first one, democratic legitimacy, it's hard to get your tongue around, uh, focuses on the legitimacy as the, of the judiciary as a whole. So underpinned by the belief that, um, and quoting Lady Hale here, the, the first, first and only woman president of the UK Supreme Court, uh, that in a democratic society in which we are all equal citizens, it is wrong in principle for authority to be wielded by such very... Uh, such a very unrepresentative section of the population, not only mainly male, overwhelmingly white, uh, but also largely the product of a limited range of educational institutions and social backgrounds. And she said that back in 2001. Um, so, and, you know, she is or was a Supreme Court judge and yet, you know, is, is saying these things. So it is acknowledged by people who are who are there, too. So on this view, greater representation is a necessary means of um, gaining public support, which someone mentioned in the chat, uh, and uh, people having confidence in the judiciary, you know, confidence that the, that the judiciary will be for them. Uh, it's um, also widely accepted that a diverse judiciary is an indispensable requirement of any democracy. That was also Lady Hale. Um, it's essential both for the judiciary itself and the democracy of which it is a part, that it is and is seen to be legitimate. And diverse representation is or should be a key aspect of this. And without it, possibly the judiciary is on shaky ground. Um, so 
that justice is best served or at least more likely to be seen or understood to be best served by a judiciary that's reflective of the variety of people that come before it is pretty uncontroversial. Um, arguments that a more di diverse judiciary is not only essential to maintain public confidence but a right that the public should demand are pretty common themes in the um, diversity debates and these are ongoing debates and, and are always there. However the impetus is not to avoid discrimination, the claim is rarely that the current underrepresentative group of judges are deliberately or even unintentionally biased, uh, but it's rather one of perception. So confidence in the judiciary and the legal system more generally is undermined when people don't or only rarely see themselves represented in, in what you see judges looking like. So it feeds a sense that judges are, you know, not like us. They're somebody else, that they're out of touch and they, you know, don't know what's going on in the real world, uh, which in turn allows for these stereotypical views of judges, the particularly the ones you see in sort of tabloid newspapers uh, as a bunch of, you know, pompous old weirdos uh, to continue to flourish. I mean, that is a perpetual stereotype that keeps coming through. And, you know, now, you know, so right now, the current climate, when the judiciary is making decisions of increasing political and constitutional importance, as we're seeing, the judiciary can no longer derive legitimacy from its legal expertise and social superiority. So, it, you know, in that sense, it does matter. Erica? This took a really interesting turn during the Brexit litigation and, and you, you may have been like aware of these headlines, um, the, the judges being enemies of the people. So this really threw into sharp relief the importance of who our judges are, but also about having confidence in who, who those judges are. And what was really interesting around the debates around the, that came up around um, who the judges were that were making the decisions um, around, around the, this litigation was because what was happening there was that you had a group of, of people who were often sort of, you might think were coming from a similar, a similar background, kind of challenging, like, who are these judges? How did they get appointed? Why is it that they are, are making decisions? And, and the, the, it really threw into sharp relief the notion that it's not just about gender or ethnicity or sexuality, but it is about background. It is about political beliefs, political persuasion and, uh, persuasions and so on. And really this coming to bear and being kind of exposed and having to be grappled with because as is coming out in some of the the chats there's a real tension between whether it matters and whether it should matter whether it matters who the judge is and whether it should matter who who the judge is and the and the brexit debate surely did um shine shine on light on that and so whilst the argument that Kirsty's just made is an argument based on democratic legitimacy of the institution as a whole a number of the comments that are being made in the um, the chat that are coming out are in fact facing up, uh, focusing on the individual people. So and this is an argument about equal opportunities that everyone who is able and would like to be a judge has the same opportunity to be a judge. So these are arguments from equity and social justice that all suitably qualified candidates should be able um, to, to have the fair crack of the whip of being able to become um, judges. And so, and former the president of the UK Supreme Court, Lord Newberger, noted this all, again almost 10 years ago and sort of suggested that the fact that the, ju the judiciary is not diverse is suggesting and is indicative that we're not getting the best judges and that there are people who could be judges um, and who could be judges who are not being able um, to get there. And this is something that, again, is coming out in some of the, I think that's coming out in the chat and some of the things that you are thinking about when if we question, well, it doesn't, does it really matter what, what our di what our, whether our judiciary is diverse if the, we're getting the best people? If the people who are making the decisions are the people who are appointing them, the kind of um, the the argument about appointing on merit, appointing on uh, in for a particular of uh, reported because of their ability to do the job, and this is a kind of response to those arguments. They're sort of suggesting that unless we think that taking the UK Supreme Court as an example, that that white men are just simply better better at being judges 
than um, other underrepresented groups, then it's it's suggesting that we're not actually getting the um, the best uh, the best candidates. And so these arguments are, are again about how the judiciary should be open to all, shouldn't be the preserve of a um, favoured few. And then there, there also leads in then to arguments around role models, the importance of having um, visibility of, of individuals to be able to be seen, to know that I could be there if I could be there um, too. Kirsty. So uh, in short, judicial diversity is good for the judiciary and it, it makes the general public more likely to trust it and accept the decisions and not call it things like enemies of the people. Uh, and is good for the people who want to be judges and for the quality of judges appointed as it makes sure that only the very best are appointed. Uh, but do you think a more diverse judiciary would make a difference to the outcome of a case? Yeah, so put another way, and talking about the sort of gender divide again, do male and female judges judge differently? What do you think about that? And this is something that people have already kind of begun to start thinking about. So is it, is it, is this about perception? Is it about um, what things look like? Is it about people being able to do particular jobs? Or are we actually getting to questions about the actual decisions that are being made? Is it making a difference to the actual decision that are, are being made? And I wonder what you, you have to, you have to think about that. So we're now getting, you, you know, Somebody's talking about how women might look at cases from a, a holistic view, taking more things into account. Um, but then somebody else is coming through and saying that no, that's a stereotype. It's a stereotype that women are, are softer and think that men, men are more strong headed. And so there's a, a danger of buying into these stereotypes. Other people talking about socialization. Somebody's come back and said that by nature, men and women think differently. Other people think it might depend on the case that's being brought to the court, because it's not simply, it might happen in, in different ways. <laughs> Somebody's suggesting that women who get to the top are likely to be smarter. Well, certainly that would be on uh, uh, what Lord Neuberger said would suggest that that is, that is gone. Like, keep those ideas coming in, because what um, Kirsty and I would like to do is to sort of give you a case example here. Um, to see whether we can kind of tease out how this might work, if that, what does it make a, a difference who the, who the judge is. And so we're going to kind of make you guys all into judges. So you are the judges in this case. Um, we've got Ben and Jerry are madly in love. They marry and have two children and a few later they, they separate. They both signed a prenuptial agreement. So they've made agreement, they've signed a contract before they go into the marriage saying that neither party will make a claim against the other party for money, for financial support if the marriage fails. But Ben is now wanting to make some kind of, um, to ask for some kind of financial support. So we've got a, a marriage that is broken down. There's two children there. They've agreed before the marriage that they would sort of simply walk away from the marriage um with making no demands on the other and now that there's one of them ben is trying to seek that um financial support so what do you think the judge should decide would it make a difference if ben had quit his well-paid job to look after the children during the marriage and would it make a difference if um jerry was independently wealthy there's no right answer to this question it's simply to try and get you so this is one of the things that we do when you come to um study law is that we use case examples so we talk about the rules we talk about um the concepts and the principles and then we use factual scenarios to try and test them to see how they um, play out in practice so this is the sort of type of uh, question that you'd encounter in um, a, a seminar situation. This would be the sort of thing that, that I'd be talking to you um, if we were sitting in the seminar. So what we what we got here is saying there's no difference because there's a, a legal con contract. Another person saying that he shouldn't get financial support. Some people saying that the money that's happened with being made within the marriage should give, should give, there should be some support. Others saying that it shouldn't be focused on the individual on Ben and Jerry, but focused on the children. Um, got somebody sort of questioning, needing to want to know more facts of the case, what's happened, um, and whether that would that sort of going to inform what the judges, excuse me, what the judges judge might decide. 
um, another person talking about a legal a legal contract. I really would like to talk to you more about that when you if you come to um, come to Kent and we get to talk to you about the importance. Like, what is it that when something is legal, when you've got a legal contract, what is it that kind of helps you know makes us think that that's something that is um, sacrosanct and we shouldn't be be messing with it? Something that we look at in our early um, intro to to obligations um, courses. Kirsty, do you want to give a what happened in real life? So this is a, a version of a uh, real life case, a uh, drawn from the case of uh, Radmacher, formerly Granatino against Granatino, which reached the Supreme Court. So a question about a, uh, a prenuptial agreement and a divorce uh, getting as far as the Supreme Court, which is pretty unusual. Uh, and in that court, uh, in that case, the court was asked to determine the weight to be given to this prenuptial agreement between uh, a German heiress who was independently wealthy and a French investment banker. So someone earning a pretty high salary, but he had quit his job uh, during the marriage to return to university. The couple had made their home in London. Uh, they were very, very wealthy, very well to do. Separated after eight years of marriage, had two children, as it says uh, in the... Uh, those mirroring facts we were looking at before marrying they'd signed this prenuptial agreement which stated that neither of them would make a claim for uh, what's known as ancillary relief but you know like a, a payment financial payments uh, from each other should the marriage break down and the husband the investment banker who'd quit his job was now seeking an order against his ex-wife for some financial support in the form of a lump sum of money and then periodic payments uh, ongoing from that and he argued that the agreement the prenuptial agreement that they signed was procedurally defective on a basis that he'd not received any independent legal advice as to its uh, veracity and uh, you know and that he was not made aware of the full extent of his wife's wealth before he signed the agreement uh, the agreement also made no provision in the event of the couple having children they'd made this agreement before they had kids uh, and in any event he argued that the agreement that he signed was manifestly unfair uh, in that it agreed for no provision for either party should the the marriage end and in whatever circumstances they found themselves so the court, and this went all the way up through the stages up to the Supreme Court, had to decide, do they enforce the agreement that the couple had, you know, grown ups, adults, had freely entered into at the start of their marriage, or did they follow the ordinary principles of uh, ancillary relief following the breakdown of a marriage, which is you know, rules established in family law about, you know, who pays what and in what circumstances. Uh, the fact that it made it all the way to the Supreme Court meant, it, you know, this could go either way. It, you know, it's going to it's going to depend. You have an odd number of judges. You're looking for a majority decision. Sometimes decisions are unilateral. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, not unilateral, unanimous. Uh, and uh, this, you know, this was a, a big question. You know, cases don't get to the Supreme Court very often and divorce cases certainly don't get to the Supreme Court very often because, you know, unfortunately, it's pretty common. Uh, what was not common was the wealth involved here and the status of this prenuptial agreement, which remains in the UK complicated. Uh, they are both unenforceable, so they're not seen as contracts in the sense that, you know, like two businesses might make a contract to sell some goods to each other. Uh, but they are something which the court is on occasion prepared to take into account. So they don't really have a sort of contractual status as such, but it is an agreement between two adults of sound mind and full capacity and all that kind of thing. And we should acknowledge here, we're talking about big money. You know, we're talking about a big, a big claim here. At first instance in the first court, the husband had been awarded a lump sum in excess of five and a half million by the judge and a yearly allowance of around 35,000 pounds, which is well above the average national wage um, and that's what she was going to have to uh, pay him for each of his two daughters while they uh, continued in education so up until the time they were 18. So that leaves us with what the Supreme Court decided. The majority, so we've got a you know, not a unanimous decision here, the majority of the Supreme Court which was sitting unusually as a panel of nine, normally it's five, but when you get a, a case with sort of serious importance like this, they, they, you know, rack up a few more members on the bench so that, you know, the case has even more significance. Uh, 
the majority was of the view that where the parties have freely entered into a prenuptial agreement and circumstances are such that it's fair to hold the parties to it, the agreement has compelling or even decisive weight. So kind of what many of you were saying in the comments, they signed an agreement and they should be held to it unless it's unfair. Uh, so on that basis, the majority decided that the rich heiress won and she didn't have to pay anything. But, but what did the dissenting judge? Who's the dissenting judge, Kerr? Oh, so there's only one single dissent, so it's an 8-1 majority, and the single dissenting voice was Lady Hale. Uh, she took a different view, so eight guys took the one view that the rich heiress won and didn't have to pay anything, but she took a different view and would have found for the husband. In her view, it would have been for the party seeking to enforce the agreement to show why it is fair to do so, rather than for usually, and uh, in this case, yes, but you know, not to the same uh, extent as in um, sort of more normal divorces, the economically weaker party to establish why it would be unfair. So it's a question of sort of reversing who had to show what. Um, so the way the majority had formulated it is that he had to show why it was unfair, whereas actually she, Lady Hale thought she had to show why it should be fair. So Radmacher is a interesting case. The judges divide along gender lines. And so it's a clear example of where judges armed with the same facts, the same material, the same knowledge of the law differ because they have different understandings of the values that the law ought to embody and reflect. And it is observably a case where women and men judges have different. And given the nature of these disputes and the issues it raised, it's possible to argue, to at least make the argument that these differences were at, at least in part attributable to the different experiences and then the different insights that men and women might have had on the role and the effect of such agreements. Now, it's okay for me to make that argument and you can take or leave it, but actually it was the argument that Lady Hale made in her judgment. This is really unusual. You don't often get judges in their judgments making comments about how they're making the decisions. And so Lady, Lady Hale's words right there in the judgment of um, uh, Radbacker is that there is a gender dimension to this issue, which some may think is ill suited to a decision by a court consisting of eight men and one woman. In other words, there is a time when who the judge is makes a difference. But what's really noti noticeable and what I hope that is getting you to, to think about this, because of course, this is a really quick canter through some very complex issues. But what I hope this is getting you to think about is, but she didn't decide for the woman. She decided for the man in this case, but she decided for the economic, um, the, the, the more economically vulnerable party. And this, the argument that Lady Hale is demonstrating, is manifesting in her judgment here, is for me, the strongest argument for judicial diversity, that there is a more diverse judiciary improves the quality of the justice um, dispense, that a judiciary with a diversity of experience, particularly at the higher levels, is more likely to achieve a just decision and a best outcome for um, society. And so this notion, we're not talking as simplistically or as straightforwardly as women judges will decide this way and male judges will decide the other, uh, men judges will decide this way. But what we're talking about is accepting the reality that who the judge is matters, that it matters where they come from and the experiences they have and that they bring those experiences um, to bear. I'm going to jump, share my, um, Screen again, Kirsty. I'm going to jump forward just slightly because um, I'm conscious of of time. Because so, what we've been trying to, what we've been demonstrating here, is what the, what I and, and other people have have argued is that who are judges matters. It matters for a number of reasons. It matters because of the legitimacy legitimacy of the institutions. It matters because of the ability of people to be able to become judges, the importance of equality and of opportunity and um, role models and, and everything connected, the important issues connected to that. But it also matters because it makes our judiciary stronger. And the stronger our judiciary is, the better the justice is, um, 
that is dispensed, that our judiciary is stronger and the justice dispensed better if there are more varied um, perspectives and experiences involved in the decision making. And this is something which you will encounter a number of times during your, your studies. What you will find is when you're looking at the, the, the cases that you'll be encouraged to interrogate what it is the judge said. Why was there disagreement here? Could it have been decided the other way? What is What do we know about this judge in terms of the particular view that they take on the law? Why? What was going on? What was the context, the background to this decision that makes, um, makes this decision more likely to be happening? And so thinking about judges, judicial diversity is a sort of theme, who the judges are is a theme that intersects and runs throughout the whole of your um, legal studies and it's something that we both look at on its own terms but also in the every um, in the everyday um, the sort of the, the more substantive areas of your um, taught law course. So um, Kirsty do you, we've reached the the end of, of where we are? Okay, so there's uh, just a few links up on the slide there. Uh, if you want to learn any more about this stuff, then there are there are plenty of things you can see. Uh, you can look at the Supreme Court blog itself, uh, or a piece that Erica wrote in the Guardian. You know, you can Google these things, or you can look them up. Or I think um, I think they were going to be pasted into the chat, so you could click on them. Uh, but anyway, they'll be this will be on YouTube anyway, so you'll be able to find it again. Uh, so things to read, watch and listen to there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, don't forget to tune in next week for another one of these. Uh, same time, same place when our colleagues uh, Alison Holmes and Lisa Dixon will be explaining how artificial intelligence is used in policing. Again, a pretty hot topic. Absolutely. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. Hope to see some of you at Kent on our beautiful campus um, into the future and um, goodbye. Bye.